Welcome to Lesson 1D, Rules and Consequences of Tensor Notation. In this lesson, we'll define and discuss some rules for tensor notation and their consequences. We'll also do some examples to practice these rules and consequences. So that you have them all in one place, here's a summary of tensor notation rules and consequences. I have four rules and three consequences. I'll discuss each one in detail, so I won't read these over now. Rule number one. The words for i equal 1, 2, or 3 are implied when i is a free index. Here's a quick comment about Greek letters. Some people use the convention that if Greek letters are used for the indices, like alpha or beta, then it's a 2D problem, so we mean 1 or 2 rather than 1, 2, or 3. Just keep in mind that this is not a universal convention, but it is used by some authors, so you must be careful when you see Greek letters used as indices. The definition of a free index is that it appears only once in an additive term. For example, suppose aij is defined as one-half del ui del xj. Notice that i appears only once in each additive term. It appears twice in the equation, but that does not make it a repeated variable. i is thus a free index. Similarly, j appears only once in each additive term. j is also therefore a free index. If we expand this out, this equation represents nine components. There are nine possible combinations of i and j when both of them are either 1, 2, or 3. In matrix form, we write aij this way. We're expanding it out from our equation. a11 is 1 half del u1 del x1, since both i and j are 1 in this expression. The a12 term becomes 1 half del u1 del x2 and the a13 term is 1 half del u1 del x3. This first row has i equal 1 and j 1, 2, and 3. The second row is similar, but i equal 2. I copied this row and pasted it. Now I change all these 1s to 2s. And for the third row, I change them all to 3s. This also agrees with our notation here. What's nice about tensor notation is that this one expression actually implies 9 components. When you see aij, you think of this matrix with these nine components. Another example is the strain rate tensor, which we'll discuss in more detail later. We use capital Sij. It's defined as 1 half del ui del xj plus del uj del xi. I note that some authors use eij instead of sij, and other authors use a lowercase s. Looking at this equation, i and j appear only once in each of these three terms. Therefore, i and j are both free indices. As with the previous example, this equation represents nine components. When you see this equation, you should be thinking that we're really writing the components of the tensor, not really the tensor itself. But in our minds, when we see Sij, or we see this, we recognize this as a second-order tensor second-order tensor has nine components and two free indices. We can expand this like we did with the previous example. When i and j are both one, we expand it this way. And since these two terms are the same, this reduces to del u1 del x1. When i is one and j is two, we have one half del u1 del x2 plus del u2 del x1. Note that I call the del operator del and it's used when we have partial derivatives. Similarly, when i equal 1 and j equal 3, we get this expression. You can fill in the rest yourself for practice. There are nine of these. The ninth one will be s33, which reduces to del u3 del x3. Since this is a second order tensor, we can write it as a matrix. And you're welcome to fill in all these components. I left a few of them out, but I want to point out that this term is equal to this term since all we did was switch these two terms around. Similarly, this term would equal this term, and this term equals this term. We say, therefore, that this is a symmetric tensor. Rule number two, summation from one to three is implied by a dummy or a repeated index. This is the summation convention that we've already been using. Again, note that if Greek letters are used, some authors imply this as summation from one to two instead of one to three. Again, this is not a universal convention, so be careful when you have Greek letters as indices. I'll do an example. Suppose we have this expression, ui del aj del xi plus bj. 
after you get used to tensor notation, you will immediately interpret this as the summation from i equal 1 to 3, ui del aj del xi, plus bj for j equal 1, 2, or 3. Because in this example, i is a dummy index, but j is a free index. The i appears twice in this term. The j appears only once in each of these terms. Again, we can expand. For j equal 1, we have u1 del a1 del x1. That's the term when i equal 1, but we have to add a second term when i equal 2, and a third term when i equal 3, and then we add our b1 where j is 1 in this line. This expression represents three separate expressions, one for j equal 1, one for j equal 2, and one for j equal 3. I copied and pasted, and I'm going to change all these j equal 1s to j equal 2s to get my second expression. I'm still summing over the i's, but now j is 2 everywhere. I do the same thing for j equal 3, putting a 3 in all of these terms where j was. The bottom line is that this is three expressions since there's one free index. This is thus a vector expression with one component for each value of j, j equal 1, 2, or 3. Rule number three says that two terms in an expression must not have different free indices. In other words, the free indices must be balanced. Let's take, for example, this expression, where u is a vector, b is a vector, e is a second-order tensor, and a is a vector. This term has one free index, i, and one dummy index, k. So we would sum up over the k's and be left with three terms. Similarly, this term has one free index, i. But the last term has one free index, j, and one dummy index, k. By our rules, this equation is not balanced. This is not a proper expression in tensor notation. We can fix it simply by changing this j to an i. This equation is proper, since i is the free index in each term, and we say that it's balanced. Rule number four is that an index must not appear more than twice in any given term in an expression. Suppose, for example, you had this expression. Index i appears once, so it's a free index. But index j appears three times. It's not a free index or a dummy index. So this expression is improper. In fact, it's kind of meaningless because we don't even know what to do with these j's. If you're working through algebra and you get something like this, it should be a red flag indicating that there's something wrong. You must have done some improper algebra. Now let's look at the consequences of tensor notation. I call these consequences because they're not really rules in themselves. They're just consequences of the previous rules that we talked about. Consequence number one is that the number of free indices determines the order of an expression. Some authors like the term rank for order. For example, if the rank is zero, it would be a zeroth order expression. There are no free indices. For example, this equation, del ui del xi equals zero. Since the i's are summed, there's no free indices on either side of this equation. This is a zeroth order expression, or a scalar. Note, however, that we can expand this to del u1 del x1 plus del u2 del x2 plus del u3 del x3 equals zero. When you see this, this is what you think in your mind. Some of you may recognize this as the continuity equation for incompressible fluid flow. This equation represents 3 to the 0, where 0 is the order, or rank of the expression, and 3 to the 0 is 1, so it represents one equation. Let's increase our order to 1. We now have a first order expression. For example, this expression, where i is a free index, and k is a dummy or repeated index. It represents 3 to the 1 or three expressions, or in this case, three equations, or components. This is thus a vector equation. We expand this del uk del xk term the same way we did here, but there's actually three equations, one for each i. When the order or rank is two, it's a second order expression. I'll use the same example as I used earlier. This expression has two free indices, i and j. It thus represents three to the two or nine components. This is thus a second order tensor, and we can continue this for third, fourth, or any order. Consequence two, any letter can be used for a dummy index, as long as it's not already a free index in the expression. For example, aj del ui del xj is identical to ak del ui del xk, where the dummy index j was replaced by the dummy index k. 
but the free index i is the same. So this represents a vector term with three components, but of course for each i we have to sum over the j or the k. If we expand this out for i equal 1, we have a1 del u1 del x1 plus a2 del u1 del x2 plus a3 del u1 del x3. That's true for either of these expressions. And then you can also write this out for i equal 2 and i equal 3. Consequence 3. A letter being used as a dummy index can be changed to some other letter, i to j or m to n, for example. Looks like I didn't copy all of this rule. That's OK, dude. We all make mistakes sometimes, man. Thanks, Joe. You're right about that. I'll fill it in here, provided that the new letter is not already a free index in the expression. Why not? It would violate rule number four. For example, suppose you're doing some algebra, and you end up with this expression. We see that i is a free index in each term, but in this term j is the repeated variable, and in this term k is the repeated variable. This term has no repeated variables. This is a vector expression since there's one free index in each term. This expression is therefore technically OK, but I like to say that it's not socially acceptable. I would never give this equation in a journal article, for example. We can modify it to make it more socially acceptable, namely change the k's to j in this second term. Again, I copied and pasted, and I'm simply going to change those k's to j's. This one is not only technically correct, it's also socially acceptable, which should make you happy. Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel for more videos.